Destination Africa brought to you by Standard Bank. Norbert, I'm going to start off with you. To what extent are we seeing a changing perception of investment risk versus opportunity when it comes to the African continent? And just how prominent have we become as an investment destination? I think, uh, thank you, by the way. Uh, I think we really see a big uh, change on the uh, uh, knowledge the investors have about Africa. If I go back a couple of years, it was actually, we were sometimes shocked about how little uh, knowledge was known in, uh, on the African uh, continent and what kind of perception we were. Typically, people would talk about Africa, about poverty, corruption, problems, crime, all these kinds of things. And they would talk about India and the BRIC countries and China about opportunities. And I think the perception has changed over the last, I would say, two, three years. And people are starting to get more informed about that actually there are huge opportunities in Africa and they're not only a once-off opportunity, they're also sustainable and will stay for a while. Mm -hmm. Admas, so certainly our weathering of the global financial crisis, managing to direct a fair share of attention our way, being part of Africa's premier development uh, institution, finance institution, you've got a view of the economic landscape that is Africa. How has Africa, in your opinion, escaped the economic crisis fairly unscathed? Well, you know, you talk about the financial crisis. 2009, the world economy shrunk by 2.2 percent. Africa continued to grow at close to 2 percent, and that was a big reduction on what Africa had managed to do for the previous decade. So even at the, at, at the sort of worst point of this past decade, growth only slowed down to positive 2%, and it, was, it remained one of the fastest growing continents in the world. And of course, you know, when people talk about the, the new reality of Africa, perceptions may have begun to change, as Norbert has said, only over the past couple of years. But the truth is the fundamentals in Africa have been changing for at least a good 10 years. And, and what we are reaping today is in, in, in many ways a, a, a return on that investment in reforms, in better governance at the economic level, at the, at the political level. We've seen dramatic changes taking place uh, since the turn of the century, essentially. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and that has really been borne by the economic growth rates. We, we see Africa's GDP growth rates up at close to 5 and 6 percent now for almost a decade since the turn of the century. And if you look at what happened in the 1990s and the 1980s, it was flat. And when you, when you count population growth, it's actually negative per capita income growth. So Africa, on a per capita basis, has been contracting for literally 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that began to change at the turn of the century. So real, there's real rises in standards of living taking place for 10 years in Africa now. Mm -hmm. Very deep and very fundamental. Well, of course, Ali Khan, uh, we've also got to hand it to investors where they've learned to anticipate just as much as they take uh, you know, cognizance of, of the opportunity and the risk as well. When it comes to anticipating things, uh, you know, it's no more, more true when it comes to anticipating developments within the political arena in South Africa. There's a perception of a shift in economic policy in Zimbabwe. We've got indigenization laws that are front of mind. In Kenya, there's rumblings within the coalition government as well. And that just a handful of the countries that are in the spotlight right now. To what extent is this still a hindrance to our progress? Well, well, I think, you know, we've actually embarked on a new trend. I think that trend is playing itself out at the moment in North Africa most violently. But essentially, it's, it's a new era of inclusion. I think governments and rulers that rule need to engage um, their citizens in a completely different manner. And I think we're somewhat behind the North African curve. But the politics is, can be a minefield. And I think what's happened across many, con uh, across many countries in Africa is that governments have been able to control the economies to a very great degree. But that, that position is no longer tenable and we're watching these economies break out of that chokehold. Some are doing it much more quickly than others. Others are taking steps back like in the Ivory Coast. But overall I think the trend is going one way and I think it's an extremely positive uh, political trend. You know, political risk in Africa was difficult to measure. I think Mohammed Ibrahim was the first to even attempt to measure it. But if you look at the broad trend, I think you're looking at a much more positive trend developing.
No, no, but what's your sense of investors becoming better at navigating around this? Because when it comes down to it, the investor has surely just simply got to become more discerning. I mean, we speak about geography, eluding uh, many an investor when it comes to the continent. But overall growth shouldn't mask the disparities uh, in economic performances by the various African countries. Yeah, there's still huge disparities, right? And by the way, you know, there's also huge uh, problems still despite all the opportunities. But I think uh, global investors are getting very smart on, on seeing these risks and are getting uh, quite well informed about it. And fundamentally, I, do, I don't believe that the risks in Africa are different or larger than doing business in any other of the BRIC countries, which very often was the perception that Africa has the problems and India and China and Brazil is very simple to invest. So I think, yes, you need to look at the risk. You need to understand them uh, uh, very in de much in detail. And that's exactly what we're saying. You should look at it and understand it. But I think investor, investors are getting uh, better. And I think the risks are also uh, getting less because the growth is very broad. It used to be in the 70s we had a commodity boom. but this is now a pretty broad uh, uh, growth set of growth opportunities. Well, of course, it's also on a geographic basis become broader. We've got Ethiopia, Ali Khan, mm. Egypt, Uganda, Tanzania, mm. Rwanda, Zambia. I mean, amongst those boasting fast growing economies right now, Ethiopia's economy, in fact, expected to grow 9.4% this year. Sitting on the east of the continent, what's your view of Ethiopia as an investment hotspot? I've been there a couple of times in the last 24 months. I mean, Ethiopia is a little bit of a hermit kingdom, and I, was, I myself was trying to put an investment into the banking sector. And in fact, I found it quite difficult because of the bureaucracy and the lack of clarity over the laws that were being shown to me at that time. But having said that, Ethiopia is a land of enormous opportunity, 80 million citizens, uh, tremendous agricultural sector, but really on the spectrum of ease of investment across the African continent, I would put it on the side of being one of the more difficult ones, just simply because of the political dispensation, the history behind it, and the nervousness around foreign investors. However, you, I found that uh, you know, there are some investors who have taken enormous positions, particularly in the uh, agricultural sector, where there's an Indian entrepreneur who's been seeded about 300,000 hectares just as one example. Mm -hmm. But within the region we have Sudan, we have the oil in Uganda which is a game changer. We have plenty of activity that's going on. And the difference I find is 10 years ago people's eyes would have glazed over and they would have said East Africa, it can't get through our credit department. And all of a sudden <laughs> it can. And I think that's really the the moment, the tipping point I'm noticing. Well, at Maso, Ethiopia, along with the majority of other countries on the continent, share a common constraint, though, and that's infrastructure or the lack thereof. I mean, challenge, but also investment opportunity. We had the IDC late last year saying that some $93 billion a year is needed to build infrastructure in sub-Saharan Africa alone. The problem is that there's a huge funding gap here. Now, PPPs are becoming more looked at to close that gap, but just what kind of a challenge are we facing in that regard? Well, Alicia, I think the numbers you're quoting are, are real. The, the gap is uh, roughly 31 to 50 billion US dollars per annum, as the, the study that uh, was quoted suggests. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy sector to, to raise funding for mm -hmm. because the quantums are huge. And, and clearly, this is uh, not a sector that's easily uh, left to the private sector. You need, you need a lot of government support, government facilitation for investment in infrastructure. I think the good news is if you, if you take a longer view over the past 20 years, you, you, you've seen a dramatic improvement in the amount of private investment coming into infrastructure. The, the best, the best well-known story now is the story of ICT, where you've had a dramatic revolution in the quality and coverage mm -hmm. of telephones, mobile telephone operators in 90% of African countries, really uh, private providers who've invested uh, billions and billions of dollars. It's, it's a huge success story. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, hopefully will will pave the way for similar revolutions to happen in the power and transport yeah. sectors. Let's pick up on that uh, power sector, Norbert, because uh, you know the opinion is that government simply doesn't have the resources to fully develop things in that quarter on its own. So what needs to be done to attract more private money down that route? Well, I think, you know, first of all, I think the, the ingoing hypothesis is right that I think governments will not be able to do everything that is required, and therefore you, you, you need private money. Uh, it, in order to do that, you know, I think 
more needs to happen what has happened in the past, as we discussed in the, be in, in the beginning. There was lots of regulatory reform, lots of business refor reform, lots of more political stability, and that's the prerequisite for getting investors in. And uh, we looked actually in our report, we looked at the gross differential. You can actually say that the countries who reform most they have a two percentage point GDP gross differential compared to countries who have, don't do anything on that one. So that's clearly the first thing. And I think it's always difficult to generalize, but I think governments often have the view to do too many things and too much themselves. And uh, when they come into the private partnership and really mean it, I think then we will see lots of investors, as we have seen on the, on the, on the telecom side, and we will see it on the port side. And of course, let's also face it, uh, we all know that uh, uh, the South-South Strait South, South has uh, uh, increased dramatically, and there's a clear interest from the Eastern economies uh, in the need for resources, in the need for food to invest. And they are coming and they will come more. Of course, we have seen uh, cement companies, you know, amongst a lot to take advantage of the opportunity. I know PPC right here in South Africa mm -hmm. saying that it's developing a strategy to move into more exciting uh, markets <laughs> in Africa. Of course, getting things going in that regard at Masuf is going to set the foundation for every sector, even mining, where we've seen the headlines that Africa could miss the next commodity boom because of infrastructure constraints. Looking at the mining story, though, that, uh, that commodity story is evolving and becoming increasingly evident is the need to create lucrative value-adding and beneficiation business sectors as well. Is enough stride being made in that regard? I think, I think the truth is our history has is, is not been a very good one in terms of adding value. I think there's a great deal of policy emphasis now on adding value, but clearly adding value is linked to human resource development. It's, it's linked to infrastructure, as you rightly say. There, there's a lot of dependencies on adding value, and I think um, it's, it's a lot easier said than done. At least the commitment is there. I think the, the, the exciting development around mining is, is what infrastructure is going to be doing for for mining, especially in the hinterland, in, in areas that uh, up till now have not been very well exploited, so to speak, and, and, and that also applies to agriculture. So when you have infrastructure and the transport space in particular opening up the hinterland to both mining and agriculture, we're going to see some, some dramatic changes in terms of the, the feasibility and, and the possibilities. Ali Khan, in South Africa alone, 10 million people are dependent on income generated by the industry. So certainly that can be taken forward. We've got Ghana jumping onto the bandwagon this year. Oil expected to push growth in that territory uh, by 12 percent. We've got gold at record highs and cocoa prices at 30-year highs adding impetus for that story. What's your perspective on Ghana's investment case? Oh, I think there's a very powerful investment case to be made. It probably looks to me as one of the most attractive medium-term stock markets to get involved in. Um, clearly, the, the amount of oil that they found is, is considerable in that jubilee field. And uh, I think you know, the, the soft commodity side of their economy is also very compelling. I think most, you know, you can make a case for practically every single African country, sub-Saharan African country you want, you care to mention. I think the key ingredients are, you know, what area of specialization you want to look at. But, you know, the thing that really interests me is not ultimately what can be dug out of the ground, but it's the billion consumers that walk upon it. The more middle class uh, Africans, as per the McKinsey report, than there are Indians. And I think the things like the mobile phones were leveraging that intellectual and human capital. Those are the businesses where I think we're going to see innovative and high. Uh, uh, high growth and that's where I for one am more focused on within these countries. Well of course as Ali Khan has highlighted of course the commodity story on the continent is a well-known one. It's been told time and time again with economic growth prospects brighter though a growing population, a population that's fast urbanizing and slowly getting richer. We take a look at other sectors that are boasting strong investment merit too. That's coming up straight after the break so stay with us.